When there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk the earth. George A. Romero, the godfather of the zombie genre, is in my mind as much a conjurer of fear as he is a teacher of lessons. Though he himself has stated his movies to be horror first, it's quite obvious that his films tend to include a prevailing social message, always honing in on the necessity of letting go. This is perhaps clearest in the final entry to his original trilogy, Day of the Dead, a film set in a decaying world which is clearly best left behind. Although this theme has been present since his debut, Night of the Living Dead, an introduction to the zombie universe still as engrossing as it is sobering, questioning the true capabilities of our American safety nets. However, neither captures the midlife chaos of Dawn of the Dead, the iconic second entry in the series, where Night of the Living Dead serves as a powerful intro and Day of the Dead as a stunning exit. Dawn of the Dead rests in an awkward kind of middle ground, where disaster has progressed over time, but leaving it totally behind has yet to become the obvious course of action. Dawn of the Dead works as a transition between night and day, while the old world is slowly ushered out and the new one starts crawling in, where the dead are increasing in number, yet aren't quite at their pinnacle. Dawn of the Dead is the line between two points, after disaster and before cataclysm, it's the confusing, desperate middle ground, where the great comforts are waning, yet still available, where the survivors clamor to get their last taste before it goes away forever. Dawn of the Dead is a film representing the difficulties of change, growing pains which are more like dying pains, in our inclinations to grasp onto a dying way of life, when, surely, we ought to be letting go. Romero's broader themes of letting go first begin with his strategy of creating recognizable horror. In an interview with Barnes & Noble, he stated his love for the concept of bringing terrible disasters to our own backyards, our own front doorsteps. He wanted to explore horror which, rather than being so detached and isolated from larger society, was right in the middle of it, crawling the streets we know by heart and reaching the people we know by name. Through zombies, he wanted to explore the possibility that vicious monsters scourging the earth would look a little bit like you and me. That their stomping grounds would be our favorite homes away from home. They would have the same interests as we do in these places. And if they also loved it here, then how were we so different? What are they doing? Why do they come here? Some kind of instinct, memory, what they used to do. This was an important place in their lives. Questioning our allegiances to old guard systems is a priority in Romero's Living Dead trilogy, and surely, he asks these questions best when he is defiling our favorite pastimes. The overrun shopping mall, made home to hordes of mindless zombies, is Dawn of the Dead's most clear-cut social satire, but a secondary point of criticism is targeted at the almost zombie-esque human loyalty to television. Fidelity to mass media when it has stopped serving you, when it no longer cares to help, if it ever did. In Dawn of the Dead, Romero paints a terrible circumstance, where the deceased walk, where malls become death halls, and where the televisions themselves are falling back on teeth-gritting doom speeches, and, amidst it all, creates mindful characters who can't help but hold on to all of it. Not be lulled by the concept that these are our family members or our friends. They are not. They will not respond to such emotions. They must be destroyed on sight. Romero's tendency to drag horror into the everyday rituals of our lives is certainly present in his cynical spin on television, subverting the traditionally pleasant grounds on which people engage with TV. The emergency programs throughout Dawn of the Dead were a shocking departure, serving not to cater for mass appeal, but only to deliver grisly fact and opinion from the film's professional mouths. Dating back to his original 1968 zombie flick, there has always been a uniquely strange paradox in Romero's depiction of TV, an electric box widely understood as a provider of easy laughs and lowbrow entertainment, 
as the primary stream of disaster updates. It strikes a particularly deep level of our contemporary programming. We interrupt this program. This is a national emergency. Important instructions will follow. Those of the television generation can likely recall a time when their TV blared out in automated weather alerts or amber alerts or even just a test message. There's an initial strike of fear when it first plays, when the running program is interrupted and the uninvited roar of compressed computerized noise shrieks out to announce itself. It certainly is alerting. The unease only continues as the cold, automated voice delivers its inhuman PSA. I think there's a universal distaste for these occasional alerts because of how out of place they are. For many years, there has been an aversion to the idea that the entertainment boxes we worship would, almost betrayingly, announce a real threat. It's a blood-chilling switch from colorful friend to stern authority in a shocking instant. A particular kind of horror can be found in that. For the older generations, who had a very solid conception of television as an escape from the real world and its troubles, for it not to live up to that reputation was just as scary a notion in fiction as it was in real life. That the television would legitimately scare you was a frightening detail of both Romero's black and white Night of the Living Dead and the later Dawn of the Dead, primarily because as a collective, we've somewhat relied on televisions and media as a whole to be anything but uneasy. And Romero, as with the shopping malls, took what we knew, what we were comfortably familiar with, and turned it inside out taking our unchallenged mental behaviors for a ride to a world where these things were no longer so appealing or so nice. And if that truly frightened us, maybe there was some self-reflection to be done. Were we bonding with these things in the wrong way? Were we too used to pleasurable media to which we gave no second thought? However, the reports persisted. Medical examinations of some of the victims bore out the fact that they had been partially devoured. And yet, in spite of this early perversion of mass media organs, effectively scaring an audience raised and fed by a jolly, happy-go-lucky style of television and radio, Dawn of the Dead also explores how unflinching our commitments to it are regardless. If the horror is found in what the televisions say, then the social commentary is found in the fact that the characters still listen, far past the point of necessity. A big reason why I love Fallout is because of the juxtaposition and tone between television and the larger world, even if only a small part of the games themselves. Take a look at the intro to the original game, or the E3 trailer for Fallout 3. There is something bone chilling about the utter disconnect on display, a world destroyed beyond repair, where all consumer luxuries are scattered and smoldering, where convincing advertisements no longer matter all that much. And, in spite of it all, there remains a lone, blaring television, which has yet to catch up. Fallout presents a post-nuclear apocalypse, a disaster whose destruction is so sudden and absolute that mass media isn't even given a chance to respond, nullifying their importance in the blink of an eye. What's so fascinating about both Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead is the idea of a disaster not so instant, which is slow and gradual enough to be managed and reported on as it occurs. Zombie infection is not an Armageddon which takes everything with it in one fell swoop, but is rather a slow boil. It's an inclement disaster which, akin to a tornado or an ice storm or a hurricane, the television can confidently confront as it comes, hour by hour, day by day. But, unlike any temporary natural disaster, infection is a permanent plague, from which the experts and the men on TV can provide no salvation.
The immediate message of both Fallout's introduction and Fallout 3's E3 trailer is that mass media is shallow, ephemeral. Televisions, what we find such enjoyment and comfort in, will hardly amount to anything when the world ends. It won't save lives or prevent destruction, it will simply keep chugging on as it has been. It is a self-sustaining force, concerned more with persisting than with helping, useless because it is incapable of adapting. Fallout conveys this immediately, and what is the most striking visual juxtaposition that gaming can offer? But Dawn of the Dead, by virtue of being based on gradual infection and not nuclear warfare, takes its time in teaching such a lesson, as its characters occupy a world undergoing a slow boil, where televisions and media maintain an air of importance for a good while. A wave of murder which is sweeping the eastern third of the nation is being committed by creatures who feast upon the flesh of their victims. Television plays an informative role in Romero's zombie movies. Newsmen deliver to the audience the undecorated statements of mass murder, resurrection, cannibalism, and all other horror which comes with a zombie apocalypse. Through TV, the characters learn, as we the audience do, the grim reality of their situation. Mainstream media, as we might expect it to, looks to both inform and aid their desperate viewers, to help the masses looking for help. Night of the Living Dead at least maintains this front. Despite everything happening outside, the news is steady, informative, straight-faced, and outwardly benevolent. Lists of available rescue stations are aired for the benefit of struggling survivors. The television is, in fact, that dependable father which the characters expect it to be. Even if it ultimately cannot save the group from their own bickering, infighting, and human shortcomings, television maintains a calm, reasonable face. A face which is, amidst all chaos, still trying. What are you saying? I mean, you know, you scientists. Dummies! You're suggesting... Dummies! Hey, Dummies! Excuse me. Listen, quiet, quiet. The evolution, or perhaps devolution, of media in the time between Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead is quite stark. Just about immediately, we can pick up on the heated, frantic, panicked mood of the new media machine. With the zombie outbreak on a nasty and inescapable rise, the systems of old world America are spinning out of control, and the operators losing grip are scrounging desperately to keep control of the reins. It's fascinating just how far into the outbreak the televisions stay on air. The broadcasts continue long after they cease to be polished or professional. Haphazardly slapped together studios which appear blatantly unfinished fill the backdrop of the later programs. The voices, which at the outbreak's beginning were once clean, orderly, decent, are now loud, inconsiderate. The pretense of First World Order sheds away so apparently in Dawn of the Dead so as to paint the last breaths of a crumbling regime. These last-ditch broadcasts are the terrible, callous, croaking cries of a behemoth on its deathbed. Like a greedy king clutching his own crown as his kingdom topples, unwilling to admit that he is no longer needed. They don't seem to have much, if any, reasoning power. And how does this spread? Because you're so full of shit. I've been saying the same Everybody damn thing all day. Gets up Tell me something I don't know, asshole! Dawn of the Dead's 2004 remake, directed by Zack Snyder, actually recaptured this quite well, I think particularly in its ability to deliver the original tone in a modern vessel. Pointless, rambling talking points of a peevish expert broadcasted through a flat screen TV while the world ends outside. The social commentary is oh so sweet. When the world ends, the so-called experts will continue to chant as they always have, telling you from their positions of comfort that which you already know. Got to remain rational, logical, logical. Scientists logical. always think in those kind of terms. It doesn't work that way. That's logical. not how people really are. By dawn of the dead, even if the common inclination to seek the news remains, television stops to truly matter. Once informative, it is now utterly demoralizing. 
If intended as educational in one way or another, the statements given are not merely realistic or practical, but also callous and detached from the general populace. Perhaps what is being said is true, but it makes the proposed necessary actions no easier. Peter knows what to do with Roger long before the television says so. He's seen the infection process enough times to know what comes at the end. He takes out Roger, not because some intellectual in an eye patch ordered him to, but because he is an experienced, decent person. And, going a step beyond recommended course of action, he gives Roger a proper burial and mourns his death, disobeying the command to remain unemotional, because he is human after all. These educated men on the TV, if themselves human, are all the same unattuned to the human experience. They will never be in the trenches as normal people are, nor ever know what it's really like to pull the trigger on a friend, no matter how fervently they preach about it. They think highly of themselves, but are nevertheless unnecessary. Deep into Dawn of the Dead, we come to find that the broadcasts are not informative anymore, and these men now only exist to somehow justify their own positions. The TV truly doesn't help. It's just the pointless, unproductive voice which sticks around long after it should have ceased. It makes nothing easier, lessens no pain, and so why don't these survivors turn it off? When there is no more room in hell, the dead will walk the earth. Today, there is actually a newly developed addiction to bad news. Where we once would be terrified of distressing information, finding its way into our recreational tools, we now live for it. There is something fun about knowing just how crazy it is, or supposedly is, out there, and if it's not done out of some twisted enjoyment, then it is done for the same reason why zombies go mall walking. Instinct. Reflexively, we look at televisions and media as the end-all be-all of reality. We base our lives around them, look to them for validation. Even if they're full of it, they can play the right face, act as though they have the information, and we'll trust them still. Anyone on a screen who would pretend to know is, to us, knowledgeable simply because of the format, because of the prestige which comes with being up on that stage. Yet their experience will never be anything like ours. They are a protected class, and the fear they preach will only serve to keep us in our place. Even if not a major element of the movie, Dawn of the Dead still demonstrates that, just as we can become addicted to technological pleasure, we can also become addicted to technological displeasure. We can become so desperate to be guided, to always be in the know about what exactly is going on out there, that we can find ourselves enslaved to bad news as we once lived on good news. Night of the Living Dead shares with Dawn of the Dead this modern itch, the compulsion unique to our time. When all is lost, find the television. We yearn to be told what is going on all the time, and without the dependable information stream, we feel lost. Ignorantly, we give credence to the messages we're told, when often they're unproductive, even misguiding. In fact, the very opening to Dawn of the Dead is a demonstration of willfully broadcasted misinformation for the sake of views. But even still, it ultimately doesn't matter if the information ceases to serve us or if it outright ceases as a whole. We will be there to receive or not receive it. By ritual, we place ourselves at its back and call, like children at a parent's side, kept by that addiction just like any other. We'll all one day have to decide for ourselves what is truly important, although that's easier said than done, and it's certainly easier when it is decided for you. 
In a world that is a muddy gray area, filled to the brim with unnecessities, where deciphering which information is useful and which is merely feigning importance is a task all of its own, there is something desirable about Fallout's world. Engulfed by a far-reaching Armageddon, which separates in one swift instant that which matters from that which doesn't. But there is also something more relatable about a slow-burning, manageable disaster which oddly resembles what we're used to. As much as I, or anyone else, may like the Fallout games or their tones, our current day is characterized more by Dawn of the Dead's circumstances. Economic ruin, civil unrest, heated politics, talks of global conflict, all of these ailments which, like zombie infection, threaten to end the world as we know it, yet haven't quite. None of these disasters have proved disastrous for anyone other than the little guy. None have been quite swift enough in their damage to knock out news outlets, cut advertising dollars, topple Washington, or in any substantial way disrupt the status quo. Nothing so far has proved too much for media to adapt to, which is why inflation will be reported, wars will be broadcasted, and if a zombie apocalypse ever befell us, I'm sure that would be televised too. Far into societal decay, the well-oiled systems will retain a face of normalcy. No matter how bad things supposedly get, how close to the brink we apparently are, you'll never be hard-pressed to find a news channel broadcast on the TV. Fear is a product, and so long as it is possible, it will be sold. It pays well to report nightly that things aren't exactly optimal after all. And we exist in a culture which tunes into this out of instinct. In wanting for information, we are quick to mistake overt cynicism for intelligence, giving undue credence to those who merely point out a bad situation. Because we are more afraid of no news than we are of bad news. Dawn of the Dead depicts a dying world which is slow to adapt, a nation which doesn't want to live without that which it has always known. The film's foremost example is that of zombified people who remember so loyally their favorite local shopping mall over all else. But I find a particular fascination in its lesser depictions of a media machine which struggles to retain relevance in a time of crumbling normalcy. Through Dawn of the Dead, George Romero argues that, even in times of uncertainty or disaster, the news ultimately won't tell you anything you don't already know, and your best bet is to turn the TV off. It's natural to not want to though, the drive against it is baked into us on some level. It takes willpower and bravery alike to step away from the guiding voice we yearn for, but at a certain point, it's time to realize that that voice is a croak. It has begun to die, and it no longer works to your benefit. For all of the talks supposing that the world will come to end in one way or another, whether by disease, war, or other cataclysmic events, the world has, miraculously, managed to keep going, because these disasters are ultimately manageable. And so long as the disasters we face are manageable, reportable, then there will be nothing and nobody to stop you from tuning in. In George Romero's Living Dead timeline, even widespread zombie infection proves only a slow death for the media machine. And seeing as how we have yet to be plagued with anything as bad thus far, I don't see our machines releasing their clutches anytime soon. Anyone looking to escape from the closed circuit of fear peddling will never receive such a directive from the screen personalities. That first step will have to be taken yourself.